Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. I am dialing in from sunny Boston. We're supposed to have a heat wave over the next few days. If you're in a similar situation, hope you're uh, in a room with, with air conditioning. Um, I'll give you a quick overview of, of Alego. I'm product marketing director at Alego. Uh, we equip sellers with content, learning, coaching, and virtual selling capabilities to help win over buyers. Um, my background includes uh, working for a sales training and consulting company for about five years. I uh, used to be um, a salesperson. I sold copiers door to door for a number of years. And I'm really excited to be working at Alego to help enable um, sellers to be successful uh, in selling virtually. And um, Hannah, do you want to introduce yourself before we kind of dive in? Yeah. Hey, everyone. Thanks, Dennis. Um, my name is Hannah Elliott. I am here in Nashville, Tennessee, um, which means that probably half of you have visited on like a bachelor or bachelorette party sometime in the last 10 years. Um, I am vice president of revenue at Vendition, which means I support any team that focuses on our prospect and customer relationship, sales channel, SDR, marketing, partner success. Um, as for Vendition, we help B2B software companies find, assess, and onboard best-in-class SDRs through a diverse talent pool and apprenticeship program. Um, ultimately, we want to help open up tech sales careers for, um, for everyone, careers that you and I have had a great time um, in and been, uh, you know, had a lot of financial mobility with. We want to make sure that everyone has access to those careers. So if you need help with any of that stuff, shoot me a note, but let's uh, get down to it, Dennis. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Um, let's let's dive in. I think Savannah covered um, sort of the objectives and the uh, uh, agenda for the session, but essentially we're going to be covering uh, three key major trends that are shaping the world of, of selling and buying and thinking about each of our responsibilities today um, on this call through that lens is going to ensure success in not only helping you deliver more compelling uh, learning and content to your reps, but also equipping them with the knowledge and content they need to win over their buyers and cater to them the way that they want to interact in these buying and selling interactions. So we'll cover each in turn. We'll pause for some discussion. Uh, there's some polls along the way. So please uh, don't be shy to use the Q&A window and the chat window. Um, I'll be popping in and taking a look every now and then. And uh, let's make this conversational. So. Before we get going, um, a, a quick poll. How many of you have implemented a new process for your reps uh, since the beginning of the year, right? This could be uh, a new messaging initiative. It could be a new training initiative. It could be a new operational process. It could be, you know, structuring uh, the teams to align to different, you know, business units or industry verticals. Um, just curious to get a sense for the amount of change that's happening uh, among your team. So A is, yep, I've got a new process. B is no, you know, we're still doing kind of what we did pre-pandemic, slow and steady. Um, or C, right, we're, we're planning on something, but we haven't quite rolled out anything yet. So I'm seeing some responses uh, pop in. Um, again, as anticipated, we're seeing, yes, I've got a new process, about 75% so far, right? So, um, not unsurprising, right? A lot of us are reacting to, you know, the changing market dynamics in our respective industries, uh, new team members coming on board, right? Uh, so it's not, not too um, surprising to see the amount of change that's happening across all of, our, all of our teams. So I think we can close the poll. I'm seeing we're finishing at about 76% um, saying that they've got a new process and about 17% saying they're pl planning to roll out something new later in the year. So all the while, you know, we're rolling out new processes and changes happening internally within our organizations. Uh, the world of buying is also changing quite rapidly, right? Um, I think most of us are familiar with this illustration by Gartner. There are different variations of it across the web, uh, but it essentially shows the complexity of the B2B buying journey and the modern B2B buying journey, right? Multiple members of the buying committee across different departments, they want to do their own research online, right? They don't really want to talk to anybody. Uh, as such, 
which makes really difficult the SDR function on our right, as I'm sure you can <laughs> you can relate to. So I have a ton of respect for all of our colleagues that are in the SDR function. Um, it's a it's a fantastic entryway into a sales career. But let's be honest, it's difficult, right? It's a it's a really challenging role for most folks. This is their first entry into the professional world, right? Uh, and they've got a really difficult uh, task ahead of them, especially if they're selling complex B two B. Uh, products and services, whether you're in you know finance or life sciences or manufacturing or, or whatever industry you're in, it's very difficult to gain the attention of the buyer. First of all, and when you've got them on a call, try to uncover the other members of that buying committee. Uh, try to expand you know um, your your presence in the account and really convince them to take action. Right, and this is why it's so important um, to you know highlight our first trend here. Right, in terms of convenience right? Selling teams and buying teams alike want convenience in an increasingly uh, complex and complicated world, right? We talked about the change that all of you are undergoing, what's going on in the buying, um, sort of the buying process. Yet, in terms of learning, when we think about sales enablement, only about 1% of a typical work week is spent on skills and knowledge improvement by sales teams. Again, I'll say it again, 1%, right? Uh, I know that you know those of us that are in an enablement function or a training function or supporting sales training efforts can't really fathom this, right? But um, in terms of you know, the, the responsibilities these teams have, everything that's coming at them from every which direction, they're just so much more pressed for time than ever. And it's really hard to digest um, and, and really consume learning, right? So we got to make it more convenient for them. So that's number one. When we think about the content side of things, um, you know, according to Gartner, 77% of B2B buyers state that their latest purchase was difficult, right? So there's so much opportunity for us to arm our sales teams, arm our SDRs, our AEs, our account managers um, with processes, with tools, with content to make that journey easy, right? To make that journey more convenient. And that's going to make you stand out. That's going to make your reps stand out. Hannah, I saw you, you come out of come off of mute there. Would you want to contribute something here? Yeah, yeah. You know, you were asking about um, changes in in process recently, and you know, I think very, very recently. And I actually see our SDR manager on right now. Hey, Miguel, um, mm -hmm. he rules. He's awesome. Um, but we're, you know, even in the last couple of weeks, we've seen our team change up our processes. We're reevaluating who who's in our buying committee, we're reevaluating our tech stacks, making sure that they're actually working for us and actually mm -hmm. effective. So, you know, one, um, one opportunity I think that we have during these kind of weird, uncertain market times is to actually dive down and spend time um, reevaluating some of those things that have worked in the past that maybe are a little bit tougher now. And, um, you know, one thing that really struck me as we were going through this um, deck earlier is one that 1% number. Um, I think probably everyone on this call, I'm guessing, is an ambitious, driven person that wants to get better every day. Um, but to see that 1% of time is spent on actually doing that is kind of offensive to me too. Um, and I think it makes it even harder for us on the call, right? Um, it's not just about taking the time for yourself, which I am horrible at, but it's also about making sure that you're setting aside that time for your team members to really let them reevaluate, revisit uh, things that they need to change, processes that they need to change and continue on that learning and growth path. So I just wanted to recognize like it's, it's for everyone who's in a management position, it's like a double um, conundrum for you to to have to deal with this trend and challenge that we're seeing right now no no absolutely and i think um, that's a good transition into our subsequent slide here in terms of what's the impact of enablement right um i think the impact is sellers need to be able to easily access relevant learning in the moment of need right um because the last thing you want to do is pull your reps out of the field right take away from their selling time um because let's be honest they have a quota to hit you know, they're measured based on that. Um, money drives their behavior and they're going to optimize towards that, right? And that, that fuels the growth of the business. So how can we make learning 
consumable, digestible, engaging in a way that doesn't take away from that time that really makes them productive and makes your business grow, right? So that's number one. Number two is sellers must stand out from uh, by making the sales process more convenient um, and their interactions more relevant for their buyers, right? What are the ways in this new digital economy that we're in to stand out from the crowd, right? Are you just another email in an inbox, right? Are you just another, you know, overlooked message in a, in a LinkedIn uh, stream, right? So what are the different ways and new and modern approaches you can use or arm your reps with to help them get in the door and stand out and make it more easy for their buyers, right? So those are the things we're going we're gonna to talk about. So in terms of strategies for success, right? I think, you know, one of the first things I mentioned was optimizing for reps flow of work across systems and locations. And when I think about that, it's really making training accessible. Uh, we, we mentioned this at the moment of need. What is the moment of need for a rep? It's right before a call, right? I'm going to jump on a call. I need to remember, you know, either what the messaging was or what the best collateral is, or, you know, how can I quickly refresh my memory before going into that call so I'm more confident, right? I, I like to give the analogy of, uh, you know, something breaks in your house, you go on YouTube, right? Maybe it's a, it's a faucet broke, right? And you need to learn how to fix that faucet. It's not like, you, you know, you, you learned about how to fix faucets weeks ago and you remember that and you do it on the spot. Um, you need something that's just in time, right before that need um, and doesn't consume much of your time and arms you with the knowledge you need, right? That's really how we need to start thinking about training and enablement, moving a, not completely away from formal approaches, right? That's structured curriculum and live sessions. Those still have a time and place, but you need to make that learning accessible within the flow of work, right? Um, in your CRM, for instance, or in outreach or, you know, in the areas where sellers are living and breathing and make it easily accessible when they're about to jump on a call with a prospect. So that's number one. Curious what you think about that, Anna, or what some of your comments are on, are on that. Yeah, you know, we really focus on, um, at Vendition, we really focus on the, the first 90 days of a new seller's um, engagement. And so, um, you know, one thing that one thing that I would say is like the learning in a bubble is not a very effective way to actually get your sellers to ramp. Again, if you're a manager on the call and you are focused with ramping sellers or even just like iterating and improving on um, performance of existing sellers on your team, um, the learning in a bubble like boot camp style often doesn't translate to the real world. And so just totally agree with you. Um, you know, what you're saying there, it has to be real time. It has to be customized. Learning about what a buyer persona is, is like 10% effective, but learning about what your specific buyer persona is um, while you're actually role-playing and um, cold calling um, on the floor is uh, just infinitely more effective and you're going to get better, ramp, uh, better reps ramped faster. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm going to draw on my personal experience here when I used to be a seller. Um, I used to sell Canon copiers, right? So I would go door to door, uh, you know, call on office managers, try to sell, you know, a, a mostly dying technology. And again, this was during the recession. It was like 2009 or 2010. Uh, it was a really challenging role. But I remember as part of my onboarding for that role, you know, we were in New Jersey for two to three weeks, just learning about product, 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 what's the speeds and the feeds, the copiers, right? Um, and then our, you know, our, our sales skill and conversation framework. I mean, after the end of those two, three weeks, my brain was mush, right? <laughs> my brain was mush. And then I'm expected to go into the field and hit my quota. And I couldn't recall anything, right? The majority of the way that I learned when I was in a sales role, and I think a lot of my sales colleagues will relate to this, is by collaborating with my peers, my manager, by applying the learning in the field, right? And there's research that backs this up, Right. Sellers mostly learn uh, through informal channels, right? Either by collaborating with their manager, their peers, observing what A players are doing, and then adapting and picking um, styles and pitches and conversation um, anecdotes that fit their style, right? And that works. And I think that needs to be complementary to that formal course coursework, right? It can't be one or the other. They both need to work together and the learning needs to be digestible, relevant, and delivered in the areas that sellers live and breathe every day. I think that's just critical. Yeah. That's just critical. Um, 
And to give a specific example there too, we've got a customer, Big ID, who we absolutely love working with. Um, they've created learning pods on their sales teams. Um, so whether it's, um, again, like a new person or someone who's working on a specific skill in general, they're matching them up with a more seasoned rep or someone who's really mastered that skill for 30 to 60 days. Um, that means they're shadowing, they're learning um, on the fly. It's not totally reliant on the manager um, to, uh, to do that for every single person. They're shadowing them. And, you know, a lot of times too, having that like additional mentor or partner um, can help them be a little bit more open and vulnerable with some of the challenges that they're facing as well. So just to share a specific example of how that works in real life, um, Big ID is doing a great job there. No, absolutely. And I think, you know, uh, in terms of our customer base at Lego, we have, you know, numerous customers using um, conversation intelligence capabilities to help reps on board and observe those eight players and what they're doing, essentially clipping uh, those calls for best practices and best approaches. So when reps are onboarding, they already have a library of what the best reps are doing, right? I mean, when I, when I was a seller, we unfortunately didn't have that kind of technology and it was me, you know, mostly being a fly on the wall, right? On a, on a call or listening in the bullpen and try to pick up things. Uh, but that process has just gotten so much easier, right? Um, in being able to share some of those best practices and sprinkle that in along with your formal hey, product training, sales skill training, uh, by having them really observe what's happening in the field uh, and then have avenues to actually practice that, right? And in and, and interactive simulations and back and forth with, uh, with reps before they actually go into the field. And that's just going to make them so much more, more confident and competent, right? And I think that's really what we what we're mentioning and what we mean when we say deliver a rep-centric experience. And a rep-centric experience is you've got to practice your craft before you go in, right? You need to be able to take that knowledge and apply it in a safe environment. And I know that a lot of us, you know, rely on, um, you know, these, these role plays that are, that are done in pockets, but, you know, doing that at scale uh, is really going to help your, um, your reps be more confident before they go into the field. So I think that's really critical that practice element is, is really important. So with that, now let's see if they've got any questions or any comments before I advance here. Let's see, um, Arthur has a question. Thanks Arthur for submitting that. Uh, do you get a permission from the customer to record the meeting to use it as a learning material for a rep? That's a good question, right? And I think um, in the US at least there are differing uh, regulations from state to state and at the federal level. At the federal level, you only need one party consent to record. Uh, in some states, there's dual party consent. Uh, and I think most of you have probably heard this either when you're, you know, calling your cable provider to cancel or upgrade. They say this call will be recorded for quality assurance purposes. Similar situation in B2B sales. For most, um, you know, plugins for virtual collaboration like Zoom, um, there will be a disclaimer that's uh, that's announced to the audience, and that's sufficient permission to continue, right? And again, if your prospect or your buyer objects to that announcement, you can quickly hit stop. Uh, but as long as you know everyone hears that and everyone hits that OK button, you you can use that as a resource and clip some of those calls and create that library of best practices uh, for for your teams. And you, and the good thing about that is. Uh, with the rate of rep turnover that we're seeing, right? A lot of your, I'm sure some of us on the call, you've had a top performer leave recently within the past year or two, right? Uh, when they leave, they take so much in institutional knowledge away with them. But if you're able to capture some of those great moments and what they do well, that stays with you and your organization for a while. And that's a learning resource that can, uh, that can be applied for any new rep that comes on board, right? And so it's really important that you don't lose those. Um, and build a library of those that are easily um, accessible and shareable among your sales teams. So great question. Okay. So with that, let's um, let's transition to the second trend of of customization, right? And when we're thinking about learning, I think we touched on this uh, in our conversation, but about seventy five percent of learners want personalized courses based on their goals and skill gaps, according to LinkedIn. and this isn't this isn't surprising, right? Um, I think it's much more convenient, obviously, uh, for us as teams that support the sales organization um, to achieve scale, right? We want to create a training that applies to the masses. 
um, so that you know we can we can arm them with what they need to do their job. But you know, taking that extra effort and trying to tailor it based on their skill gaps, their knowledge gaps, or which portion of the sales and buying journey they support is so critical, right? Uh, to make the learning more relevant, more digestible, right? And more impactful. Um, I, I think of uh, an initiative that we're undergoing here at Allego, right? We're realigning some of our sales teams uh, by different industry verticals. So actually trying to narrow their focus into two instead of four or five industry verticals, right? Trying to get them more proficient in a particular talk track. Uh, and we're creating learning paths and resources specific to those industries, right? And for you on the call, you might have a different way to slice the learning, right? It could be by, you know, um, again, like I said, phases of the buying journey. It could be a particular skill like qualification or discovery. Uh, it could be by a particular product area or an industry. Just think of ways where you can make that learning more relevant and applicable uh, to your to your sales teams. And in terms of content, um, about 57% of sellers still ignore content created by marketing, according to McKinsey. Um, this one makes me sad, right? I mean, I'm a marketer. Uh, my job is to support the sales team and arm them with the content and knowledge they need uh, to win. Um, but it's it's not working, right? And that's what we're seeing in the field because marketers have a, have a challenge in being able to scale uh, the content that they're producing and make it relevant to what sellers need by the different phases of the buying journey that they're in, right? Because the content that you need to get in the door for an SDR to open up the door and set a meeting is very different than the content that you need when you're at the demo phase or you know, you're at the solution crafting phase or the negotiation phase, right? So being able to actually surface the right content based on where I'm at in the sales journey is really important versus the traditional approach is let's put all of our content in one place, right? And let sellers find it. Let's make it easy to find. Um, that's not a rep centric experience, right? You got to think about what the rep is going through. I have an account. I have an opportunity. I'm in prospecting. What is the content that I need at that phase? So thinking about and reframing your content organization and um, activation strategy within the, the framework of the sales journey can really help you tailor uh, the, the content that you deliver to your teams and hopefully get better adoption, right? One thing I think that's super interesting there to Dennis is just, um, you know, even though we have all of these tools, and I know you'll talk about tech stack in a second, but even though we have all of these tools that really help us scale, accelerate, automate everything. Um, and even though buyers are doing so much more of their research before they ever speak to a salesperson, um, the humanity of um, being able to deliver what the buyer needs at the exact same time, I think goes a really long way. Um, and it doesn't have to be like a you know, we don't have to arm our salespeople and turn them into like content creators themselves. I think there's still like really lightweight ways they can, like you were saying, choose the right content for where someone is in their buy, buying cycle um, and give their own little spin on it. So still using and taking advantage of the marketing content, but sharing that like, hey, I'm a person, I'm actually an expert in this space. I talk to hundreds of people who are in the same role as you and have similar challenges as you. Um, and really set themselves up to be human, trusted, and authentic. Like the, the relationship is not gone from sales, even though we still have all of these tools for automation, acceleration, et cetera. No, I completely agree, Anna, right? And again, I, I have a bias for technology. Obviously, I work, I work for a software company, but you don't necessarily need software to get started here, right? Um, you can achieve this out really easily uh, by starting small, and just thinking about organizing your content and your taxonomy um, by those phases of the buyer journey, right? So one of the things that I've done in past roles as a product marketer, again, I'm organizing all of our sales content, right? I think about the buyer journey in three phases. Keep it simple, right? I'm a big fan of simple. Uh, I know that most of us probably have like seven, eight, nine different stages of the sales process. You know, don't try to make it overly complicated for your reps, right? There's awareness, there's consideration, and there's decision, right? Just keep it three broad buckets. And then on the rows, what I did was I said, okay, if I'm a seller, I need to know what's external and internal because let's face it, some content, you don't want me sharing externally, right? Uh, and some content is more internal reference. So on the rows, what I did is I said, okay, here's the external content and here's the internal content. So what do you have? You have a two by three grid, 
right? And now you can put the best of the best content on that one cheat sheet, right? Link it to wherever it is you might be using, you know, maybe Google Drive or something simple, right? Or maybe you already have a content system, right? Whatever it is, just creating that cheat sheet and giving your reps that as a single uh, reference guide has worked really well for me, right? And reps love that because it just makes it easy for them rather than saying, hey, go here and try to find it, right? Obviously, there's technology that can make this easier too. But before you make the case for investing in a content management system, you can start small and see if this works. And if it does, technology can take that and make it even better, right? By surfacing that content when they're in the CRM, uh, tag to the opportunity, they know what phase of the buying journey they're in. Here's all the great content, right? Um, so just a quick tip for those of you on the call. Um, create that one page cheat sheet, right? Awareness, consideration, decision, internal, external. I bet you that your reps are going to love it, right? And it just makes it easier to find that content based on where they are in the sales process, right? Um, so let's talk a little bit more about strategies for success. That's one tip, right? I think uh, delivering rich seller and buyer content experiences on their terms. This one's important. I think you brought this one up, Hannah, right? You mentioned that buyers are empowered more than ever, right? They've done their research, right? There's so much information available online now, uh, whether it's on G2 or these other software review sites like Trust Radius, right? They're probably talking to their trusted network and saying, hey, like, who are the, you know, three to five vendors I should be speaking to? They're going to your website. They're looking at Forrester and Garker and all these analyst reports. Before you know it, they know a ton about your product right, before they've even spoken to a rep. So it's really important for that first interaction um, to be really relevant and catering to what buyers need, right? And I think uh, we, we've seen, uh, you know, new technology emerge here to help with that ongoing buyer and seller collaboration in a digital environment um, that helps enable that, right? As soon as that live meeting ends and you've had that initial conversation, how do you stay top of mind and deliver the additional information that the buyer needs to make a better decision to go with you or to further vet you and, and go further along the sales funnel? It's the concept of uh, digital sales rooms, right? Maybe some of you have heard about it. Uh, maybe some of you are already using it, but it's essentially a fancy term for a seller that can create a web page, right? And why is this important? Because for those of you that are on the call that aren't using this technology, your competitors might, right? And um, if you're only locked into LinkedIn and email and phone as your primary channels, you're missing out on an additional way to engage your buyers, um, especially after some of those live interactions have ended, right? After this webinar ends or after this live Zoom call ends, how do I talk to my prospect and keep top of mind? What better way to do that than to create a web page that's really deep in the funnel, right? Where you can share some of that information that goes beyond those foresters and the G2 crowd and what they found on your website. That's more relevant to what they need to uncover to be confident to move forward, right? In, in the buying journey. So it's really important uh, to use some of these new technologies and these new avenues to reach your buyers and essentially create your presence uh, and stay top of mind even when you're not on a live meeting, right? There's so much opportunity there. And I'm curious, Hannah, if in your experience in working with, with SDR teams, um, how are they connecting with their buyers? How are they delivering relevance to their buyers? What have you observed in some of the SDR teams that, you, that you've worked with? Because again, this is one of the primary challenges of SDRs, right? You've got inbound SDRs, you've got outbound SDRs. Outbound, Getting that meeting is the most critical, right? Making that first connection and booking a meeting for your AE or your, or your rep. Uh, for the inbound team, you got to quickly react and understand, hey, where does my, what does my buyer already know? And how do I tailor my talk track based on their knowledge level? They might be super knowledgeable, in which case you got to catch up and give them more detail and value, or they might not know anything, in which case you kind of have to back up and give them the whole kind of elevator speech. So I'm just curious what... What, what, what you've seen works? What are some of the challenges you're seeing? And um, if, if our audience has any questions, please throw them in the Q&A window. I'll just poke around right now. Yeah, um, it's a good question. It's a broad question because they're so, people are doing things so differently across the spectrum. You know, we work with hundreds of hiring partners and hiring managers every year who each have their own process um, for ensuring that their SDRs get up to speed quickly. 
Um, I will say, uh, you know, let's see who, I think Arthur maybe asked the question. I can't find it right now, but I think Arthur asked the question about how do you do that, especially with a decentralized or remote team. Yeah. And most, most of the time right now, more often than not, we're seeing that um, a lot of folks out there are remote. It's the norm more than the um, exception right now. And so having a centralized hub for content, having a very clearly defined buying process that's, that uh, outlines exactly what the buyer needs at each stage of the funnel, and then doing that one-off training. And again, having accountability partners, having external coaches and mentors that are working with your hiring managers to make sure that the um, the sellers, as they're learning, they get not only the institutionalized, very structured content, but also that ability to riff, ask questions without fear um, has been a really critical thing that we've been seeing, um, no, especially over the last agree. couple of months. No, I completely agree. And Arthur, thanks again for that great question, right? For a decentralized company. Um, and I think for most organizations, they've somewhat become decentralized, not by choice, but by what the pandemic has kind of changed, right? Um, most of us are probably in somewhat of a hybrid model, right? There's certain verticals and in industries, maybe life sciences, right? Where your reps are still actively in the field and face-to-face -face with doctors, surgeons, et cetera. Uh, but for some industries like tech and some others, right, your, your reps are probably in a location where there are no peers, right? They're in their room, they're in their office at home, right? And it's so hard to get that collaboration and that information sharing that we talked about in the first trend of, you know, convenience, right? Where, you know, reps really need convenient learning that's both formal and informal. That informal piece is missing now, right? It's so difficult for me to kind of pick up on, on what my colleagues are doing in the bullpen or, you know, what, um, what I hear over here from conversations, the water cooler conversations and the collaboration, that's gone, right? It's so difficult to do that. And I think what's really important there is to create um, and invest in technology that allows that asynchronous collaboration. What do I mean by asynchronous collaboration? Um, so synchronous is what we're doing right now. It's a live meeting, right? We're all on it together. We have to book time out of our calendars, right? We all have to find the slot in our calendar and we're being taken away from our day-to-day -day jobs, right? To do this. Um, same thing for our rep, right? To go on a training, they need to stop what they're doing go on a live call and invest the time. With asynchronous collaboration, they can actually consume learning, uh, engage in discussions on their own time, right? So when they have a pocket um, of time or a time window, they can quickly look, log into this learning tool and observe the back and forth discussion. Sort of a, I would say a modern forum, right? When you go to a forum, you post something, you wait a couple of days, someone posts a reply and you kind of create that engaging community of their social network. Uh, and there are tools like that that help you collaborate asynchronously where you're not taken out of the field, right? You don't have to carve out time for learning, but you've got that kind of culture of learning and coaching and collaboration that builds, even if you're in a remote office, right? If you're not in, in with uh, other people in the, in the same location and in the same time slot. Uh, so I think to kind of go back to your question, Arthur, what's the best practice to teach your reps? you got to enable them to kind of tap into that informal learning network, right? And there are tools that let you do that. You can certainly, you know, bootstrap it, create maybe a Slack channel or a Teams channel, right? Where kind of these, these folks can come in and share ideas with one another. There are definitely, you know, easy ways to do that without much investment. Uh, but I think that's just so critical. you got to empower them with that informal learning. And to give two examples too about, just things that our teams are doing at Vendition. Um, and they're super simple, but every week, all of the AEs um, send a call review of the week out to the team. They um, list our conversation intelligence tool, the link directly to the call. Here are things that I did well, here are things that um, I wanna improve on or work on for next time. Everyone's able to listen to everyone else's calls where to your point, Dennis, when we were coming up, we heard what, this person was saying on a call because we, our desk was right next to them and we just like don't have that anymore. So that's one way we're trying to bring that same kind of like absorbing from everyone 
um, around us learning style into um, a remote environment. And then the other thing that our SDRs are doing, and Miguel, maybe you want to pop this into the chat, but we'll have regular cold call and video creation um, blitzes where we all hop on a Google Meet or a Zoom and um, are just cold calling that it feels like we're all together. You can hear other people fumble and make mistakes. And that's what we've done to learn in the past. And we do try to, I know not everything is a direct one-to-one -one correlation from in office to um, remote, but that's just another way you can kind of start to break down those barriers of um, being isolated and in a silo in your house by yourself. <laughs> Completely on our right. I mean, I, I love using the sports analogy whenever I'm talking about sales, right? And again, I'm, I'm from the Boston area, so sorry if I'm gonna alienate some of, our, some of our listeners and viewers today, but I'm a Celtics fan, I'm a Patriots fan, right? What does the Celtics and the Patriots and really any professional uh, sports team do after they finish a game? They watch the game tape, right? They learn from their mistakes. They sit together as a team and look at the plays, right? What worked, what didn't work, how can we get better? That informal learning and that kind of uh, tiger team of the sales team coming together and learning from one another is so important, right? And I feel like we've kind of lost sight of that in some pockets. And it's really important for as enablement leaders, as sales leaders to make time for that, right? Especially if your teams are remote, they're feeling isolated, they're not really feeling connected. And maybe that's some of the reasons why they're leaving, right? Or they're churning. Bring them together. Let them learn from one another. Create that culture of being okay with failure, right? Um, there's no better way to get people to learn than to be comfortable sharing their failures with one another and being okay with that, right? And I think it, it just goes, goes such a long way, even if you get some of your top performers who have failed or done something wrong, and they share that because most of the time, other reps are going to follow the lead of who's the best performer. And if they set that example, that's going to change the dynamic of your culture and help people learn from one another. I think it's just so important. Um, Let's see here, Antonios um, says, are we really surprised that content isn't read? The mat uh, maturation of the internet has, has allowed the buyer to do research without emitting intent. And we talked about this as well, right? Um, I think buyers want to do research on their own terms. You could send them content, uh, but most of the time, chances are they've already learned all they're gonna learn, right? From sources that are available to them. Um, so it's really important to meet your buyer where they are and give them content that's going to resonate, right? So it's already, someone's already done all their research on your website. Don't send them something that's already on your website, right? Give them some, add them some additional value and meet them where they are. Uh, and that's why these digital sales rooms are so important because it allows you to collaborate and share content that's relevant to them and message them, right? Talk with them outside of traditional email and phone channels. Um, again, here in terms of discussion, I think you know, tailoring learning and content for different roles, teams, desired outcomes, and, you know, using automation to power some of those learning recommendations and content recommendations is, is also important. Uh, like I mentioned at Allego here, we're, we're undergoing some changes about how we're structuring our sales teams and what they're responsible for. So that's how we're thinking about our learning and content, right? Through the lens of those different industry verticals and the personas and trying to make it really targeted. So it's easier for the reps, right? It might be a little bit more extra work for us, right? I got to create tons of learning content because I create all these different variations, but that extra effort goes such a long way to make it more relevant for the SDRs, for the AEs, and hopefully help them make uh, better, um, better, lead better conversations with, with their buyers, right? Yeah, I think the outcomes is really important there also. Um... You know, I'm getting us a little bit off the topic of content and enablement. Well, I mean, this still counts as enablement, but, you know, just ensuring too, like it seems like such a dumb moment, but we've seen so many hiring managers make the mistake of having reps start without having very clear um, goals and expectations, whether it's activity, things to practice, skills to master, et cetera. Um, especially during their first 90 days, but again, continues on throughout an ent uh, rep's entire life cycle with you. Um, and so having those very clear 
milestones throughout. And again, especially in remote environments when you don't, you aren't able to see what everyone else is doing just so people know that they're winning, right? Like the setting smart goals is important. The SMART goals is important. People want to know that they're winning. And if they don't, they start looking elsewhere. And in this kind of environment, you've got to make sure that every one of your team members is really performing and really counts, really knows how to use all of the content. See, I brought it back around to content. Um, you know, while, while, while they're on the floor with you, it's not enough um, as you might do in an office environment just to let it naturally happen. You have to really intentionally work on what is the outcome? How am I gonna measure it? What are the expectations? Um, and it frankly just takes a lot more time um, than it used to, I think, but it's also worth it. And that's just the new environment of um, enabling sales teams. Yeah, Hannah, I love the idea of winning, right? Because winning is contagious, right? If you see another rep that's succeeding in your role, right, and crushing it and meeting their meeting goals or quota, right, and they have a specific way that they do it, you, you think to yourself, if you're a new SDR or a new rep, hey, I can do that, right? So sharing those wins and successes um, during the onboarding and frankly, throughout the life cycle of a rep is really important because to your point, you know, if you're in your isolation, you're at home, right? You're only in, entering and attending formal courses um, and maybe here and here, there are successes. It's difficult, right? I mean, you get demotivated and motivation kills S the SDR function, especially, right? I mean, you've got to be self-motivated. You've got to be okay with rejection, right? And you got to have that energy to put in, you know, a hundred outreaches to get that one meeting, right? And as soon as you lose that energy and enthusiasm, you've got one foot out the door. So what better way to build that excitement and, and interest than sharing successes, wins, how the top performers are doing well, and use that as an avenue to, to develop your teams. Fantastic idea. Um, I'll quickly share here, you know, something that we're doing, right? Like I mentioned, um, you know, we're, we're undergoing some change in our, in our organization, specifically within, you know, our SDR team. And, you know, one of the things that we're going to be rolling out um, is a customized and more convenient SDR conversation guide, for instance, right? We know that SDR conversations are maybe five to 10 minutes, right? You get someone on a, on a call, they're a senior executive, they're busy. Okay, give me your pitch, right? I'm willing to listen. You hooked me. <laughs> Something generated interest in where I'm willing to give you a shot, right? Um, but it's really important to arm your reps with, you know, the relevant messaging, right? Make it easy to digest. Um, and, and make it resonate so that you can book that meeting, right? So what we've done is we've created these, you know, one page, it's one page, uh, right? That gives you those industry-specific talking points. If you're talking to an enablement leader in pharma, there's a specific talk track for that. If you're talking to, you know, a marketer in tech, there's a di different talk track and a certain set of challenges they're uh, going to be interested in, right? So delivering learning and content that helps those SDRs and sales team members have a more confident conversation is just so critical, right? I could have just as easily done sort of a one-shot training, you know, get everyone in the room and said, here's the new messaging, good luck. But no, right, we put in that extra effort to tailor the learning, right? And make it easy, make it simple for them. And it's just gonna go so much of a longer way to making an impact. Uh, and I guarantee you, if you all, Think about ways in which you can apply the concepts of customization and convenience in your own roles, you're going to see great success. Another thing that we did here is, is I think sometimes we, you know, um, we as you know, marketing leaders, enablement leaders, sales leaders, we want to make sure that our teams are successful. And sometimes we give them a script, right? Say, hey, like follow this format, follow this script, and then you'll be successful. But I think I honestly don't believe in that approach. I don't think complex B2B sales can be scripted, right? You gotta let your SDR team members and your AEs bring their own experience, expertise, and personality to the table because buyers can sniff that out, right? Buyers are not only savvier in terms of the knowledge that's available, but we're talking to senior executives here, right? Most of the time when you're trying to, you know, book a meeting or get access to power and you can't give your teams a script. You gotta give them the talking points and bullet format and try to make it their own. Um, otherwise, it's just going to come across to the other side and really they're going to sniff it out and probably lose credibility and trust. Uh, so that's, that's another thing that we did here is we didn't give them a script. We gave them talking points um, that have the kind of high points 
but gives them that flexibility to apply that to their own conversation and bring their own style to the table. Curious what the, what the audience thinks of this. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we can have a heated debate about it, uh, but put your comments in the chat or the Q&A and what you think about that. Um, Hannah, I'm curious about you, right? How, how have you seen SDR teams being trained? Are they mostly given like really spoon-fed scripts or you know, do they have the liberty to bring some of their own style to the table? I'm just curious if you've experienced any of that. Man, it really um, runs the gamut. I don't think there's one trend that we've seen. I think everyone does it differently. And a lot of it is based on a management style um, of who's, who's working with them. Um, but yeah, I, I do think the, you know, I've said it before, but I think the common thread that we do see among our um, most successful new sellers is that they're given, I'm, I'm just going to repeat what you just said, they're given the talking points, and then right, they're able right. to um, craft that to, you know, sometimes the channel that works best for them. Um, but also like the vehicle, whether it's video or written or call. And, you know, that's why we have some reps that do really well on LinkedIn versus calls versus emails, because they have a place where they feel more comfortable. And so we'll continue pushing reps to, um, you know, use these base foundations of knowledge and beef up their skills in the other areas. But I also think it's really important to let people know that they're winning, right? And lean in where you are succeeding, whether again, it's a more scripted approach, whether it's taking the foundations and iterating on it. So it's it's a fine balance, but we see people run the gamut, which is not a very like statistically helpful response, I think, for uh, what you were asking. No, no, I think that was, that was great. You added something, a couple of things there that I think are really important to kind of repeat for the audience, right? I think there are different channels in which your SDRs and your sellers are reaching out to your buyer, right? And a script is great for a live call, right? I can read off a script and try to make it sound natural on a live call, but let's be honest, you're sometimes leaving a voicemail, right? Sometimes you're sending a LinkedIn message. Sometimes you have to send an email, right? And I can't just copy and paste a script. I got to adapt it anyway, right? So don't give me a script. Teach me how to fish, right? Rather than just giving me, you know, that the answer, right? Um, let me play within the guardrails of a conversation framework or a communication framework. Give me the high level points and let me adapt that to the channel that I'm using. Because the, the way that reps and SDRs are reaching out are no longer just through one channel, right? There's multiple. Uh, we even just talked about digital sales rooms as a new channel, right? There's phone, there's email, there's social, there's digital sales rooms, there's all these different channels and having the foundations of the message is really critical because then you can, then they can adapt it to all those different channels, right? And make it more, more relevant and impactful. So I think that's really important as well. Great discussion. Um, another poll here uh, into our final segment. How many tools are your sellers expected to use during the sales process? This one, uh, this isn't, this one's my favorite whenever we do this one. Um, because I know, I know where we're going to land. <laughs> Right. There's just so many tools out there. There's so much technology out there. Right. And it makes it so much more difficult for your reps to gain efficiency. If, you know, part of the task they have to do is actually juggle the complexity of the different tools. Right. Let alone the logins and, and like where the URLs are. It's like, OK, once I log into that tool, there's a whole like best practice of how to use that tool. And the more tools you add to your stack. I frankly believe it's diminishing returns, right? There are a couple obviously key technologies you gotta have. You gotta have a CRM, you gotta have an enablement platform, like a couple other things, right? But you know, think about how you can streamline and make your tech stack more efficient so that it makes it more convenient for your sellers, right? They don't have to juggle and jump in and go through hoops to figure out what to use when. Um, so we're seeing here 61% are in the three to five bucket, 22% are six to 10. Thank, thank goodness no one's in 11 plus because that would be crazy. Uh, but I always like throwing that in there just in case we've got some outliers. But again, right, we all have a ton of tools in our stack, right? Uh, and this brings us to our third trend of comprehensiveness, right? So I think most companies today are stitching together multiple enablement and sales tools. And tool complexity is resulting in wasted resources and missed quotas and 
Anna, you brought, the, brought this up earlier, right? Remember in economic uncertain times, budgets are shrinking, got to do more with less, right? That's when, you know, um, you always go back to the drawing board and look at your stack and say, look, do we really need all these tools. Can we consolidate? Can we do more with less, right? We see about five to 13 average number of tools in a seller's tech stack, and that aligns with the survey we just did right now, right? According to some of the research that we've done as an enablement software company. And what we're seeing is that tool complexity is costly, right? So 76% of companies say that poor adoption of those tools is a top reason their teams miss their sales quotas, right? There are many, obviously there are many factors that contribute to probably missing quota, but we can't, I think, deny the fact that tool complexity is one of them, right? So when we're thinking about learning, you know, whether it's your LMS, your coaching tool, your call recording software, your reinforcement tool, maybe you got like something that does like flashcards or reinforcement or games or quizzes. I mean, you add all these things up, it makes it more difficult for your reps to absorb, right? Uh, the learning for them to know where to go to get that just in time concept that we talked about, right? Right before a call, where was that knowledge? Was it in this tool? Was it in that tool? Where do I go? I mean, <clears throat> all these things add up and make it more difficult, right? And that's why we're seeing so the concept of modern sales enablement and a view that's shared by gartners and foresters of the world and in segmenting sales enablement in terms of a definition of learning and content coming together, right? And supporting these five key business processes, right? So if your sales enablement tool covers onboarding, training, launches of new products, content management, right? Messaging and certifications, enabling that virtual selling, those, those digital sales rooms we talked about you know, conversation, intelligence, coaching, there's a lot, right? Um, and that's really what the modern definition of sales enablement is. And you can get so much more value out of your tool if you're able to connect all these disparate uh, functions and business processes together, right? And it's really the go-to-market team that's responsible for each of these areas, right? Marketers care about the right side, right? As a marketer, I'm releasing content and messaging. I'm somewhat involved in launches, right? Our, our enablement and training folks are responsible for the onboarding, the training, the coaching, right? Also to a degree, <clears throat> launches and rollouts. And we're thinking about sales leaders, they're sort of at the bottom, right? They're thinking about coaching. How do I ensure that collaboration that we're talking about, right? In that virtual environment where my teams are distributed across the globe or the nation, different areas. How do I bring that team together and collaborate and learn from one another? And virtual selling, right? How do I equip them with the tools beyond just Zoom, Right to have them um, be more effective and impactful and stand out from that uh, from that modern B two B buying journey. So these are all the things that need to come together and are coming together and have come together uh, for sales enablement. Right, and this is really what's going to make your uh, make your stack more streamlined and help your sellers uh, succeed. So again, my uh, my advice here for the group is assess your tech stack. Right, map out your seller workflows across those tools in those different business processes. What does it look like? Does it look like spaghetti? Is it really difficult? Is it complicated? If it is, think about how you can streamline that and make it easier for your reps, right? And is it connected to some of the core tools like your CRMs and your outreaches and you know sales lock, whatever you're using for engagement, right? Is it connected to some of those other core tools um, so that enablement becomes a key workflow within some of those engagement tools as well? And I would say seek solutions that span the spectrum of enablement. You know, this is a this is a view that's shared by Gartner, by Forrester. They know this is where the industry is heading. So if you're working with a uh, with a tool that's really solving for a niche, maybe that works for now. Uh, but you really need the whole spectrum of enablement, as you see in this diagram here, to make your uh, sellers more productive and really unite that go to market team across the, the the product, the marketing, the sales, and enablement teams. I'd add too, especially for the folks that are on the higher end in that poll. Um, as an exercise to know how to simplify and streamline your stack, make sure that every single tool in your stack has a very defined um, definition of success and hold yourself and your teams accountable to it. And if it's hard, if you, if it's hard to define what success looks like for a tool and how it actually helps you move the needle in either your sales or your marketing or whatever, um, then chances are maybe you bought it because it was, or someone bought it because it was cool and, oh, it could do this. But if it's not actually doing those things, 
then it's okay to say bye and maybe come back to it later or find something else that can help you achieve the outcome that you're looking for um, without adding on yet another thing that likely will never get used if it's not actually impacting anything. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. It's so important to have sort of KPIs <clears throat> that you monitor on an ongoing basis map to the outcome you want to drive for that tool, right? And keep your vendors honest, right? Um, good software vendors um, always lead with that in mind or aren't scared to bring that to the table and continue to prove the value that the tool is delivering. Um, so I would say, you know, make sure that you first got that mapped out. You understand what you want to get out of the tool and continually assess that. Uh, and if you're not getting it, think about how you can streamline uh, and make your processes more effective. So I think that brings us to the end. That was a great conversation. Thank you, Hannah, for joining us um, and, and the conversation. Savannah? All right, yeah, you know? everything was awesome. Thank you all for joining us today. And I hope you have a lovely rest of your day and week. Be sure to check out those resources. We will include links to those um, in our email with the recording. Uh, we don't have any more events this week, but be sure to check out next week. So we've got some cool ones coming up. We've got one breaking through the top lessons to be learned from four women leaders. And also another one um, next Thursday from pre-revenue to IPO, how to structure SDR and AE comp plans. Um, so check those out, um, save your seat, and we'll see y'all next time. Thanks, everybody.